make out just what sort of a place it was. It seemed to be a gambling house. But there weren't any walls, just a lot of curtains with eyes painted on them. The most famous scenes in Spellbound are probably the dream scenes that Salvador Dali designed. They're very decorative, and for anyone who was half awake at the time that the film was being made, they're very identifiably Salvador Dali. Salvador Dali is probably the most interesting and chameleon artist of the 20th century. There are certainly bigger artists such as um, Pablo Picasso. There are certainly perhaps more politically engaged. But I think what is really interesting about Salvador Dali is just to see the arc of his career. Salvador Dali was born in 1904 in the Catalan town of Figueres. And uh, he, from a very early age, wanted to be a painter. Obviously a child prodigy, comes from a very, very comfortable background. The only thing he can do is paint. His father was the town notary and was against this sort of an upbringing. Uh, he wanted his son to be a bureaucrat like himself. But uh, Dali had this very artistic, creative bent. So um, his father eventually allowed him to go to art school in Madrid. He meets there the flowering of Spanish culture. Um, Garcia Lorca, uh, Luis Bunuel, everybody who was important in Spanish culture was there staying in the residencia. And Salvador Dali does incredibly well. During that period, uh, Dali became very, very interested in film. Um, he was also doing paintings, obviously. He was against uh, most of what was considered sort of the prevailing avant-garde in Catalonia. However, this incredible flowering of culture also leads Dali into some very revolutionary ideas. And at the end of his university career, he decides that his professors are not apt to judge his art. But by that time, Salvador Dali already had a career, um, and it was an international career. He came up to Paris um, in 1929. Two very different things establish him, one of which is the film he made with Louis Bunuel, uh, Un Chien de Lou, The Andalusian Dog, and then his first one-man exhibition in a major surrealist gallery. And one of the most famous images in Un Chien Andalou is a woman's eyeball being sort of, you know, her eyelids being pulled apart and a razor going across her eyeball. That became the sort of iconic uh, surrealist picture, surrealist when it wasn't actually intending to be surrealist, I suppose. In Spellbound, it's kind of mirrored where you have the man with the giant scissors cutting the curtain that's uh, painted with eyeballs. These two things really found um, sort of Dali's position as a major artist, an artist involved in sort of obviously painting, but also one who is interested in other media such as um, film. He, he was interested in double images, the way that one image morphs into another. W film really allowed for that. He was also interested in uh, the ability of a close-up, where if you look at something very, very closely, it looks different than if you were to pan back. So that, that actually influences his painting later on. Filmmakers were, of course, very interested in uh, surrealism, well, at least Hitchcock, <laughs> uh, because dream is central to the theory of surrealism. Surrealism was a desire to uh, release individuals from social, religious, psychological constraints. Surrealism uh, was conceived as an uh, international, and multimedia think tank, even though it was literary at the beginning. Dali was doing shows at the time and selling paintings, but really the surrealist interest in him initially was primarily for his, his work on a chandelier. Once he got in, he had an artistic style that was befitting the surrealist project as far as looking at the sub subconscious, but it was very different from what the rest of the surrealists were doing at the time. Most of the surrealists were trying to do automatic drawing, sort of scribbling something, and then they would look for the image inside there as a way to get their subconscious into an automatic work. Dali's mode was completely different than that. He, uh, he wanted to paint his dreams because he felt his dreams were a reflection of the subconscious, but with very copious exactitude. That he, that they were going to be uh, very carefully done in sort of an old master's technique. The importance of Dali's painting primarily has to do with his incorporation of a very, very hyper-realistic technical style to depict nightmares. And it's this sort of trick of the eye where Salvador Dali makes you believe things and your eye is saying, yes, that works, but your mind is saying, no, that cannot work. This is what he had envisioned and he didn't really have a ready explanation for it. He said that he didn't really understand what his painting meant at the time he was doing it. And so it would be, end up 
filled with various symbols and things that he would then kind of step back and try to interpret himself. Interestingly, in the 1930s, it was Dali that founded Surrealism or came to embody Surrealism in the United States. One of the things Hitchcock used was a lot of sort of Freudian psychological imagery, and that's very prevalent in Spellbound. Probably the Freudian theory that most influenced Dali was the Oedipus complex. Freud's is a theory that a son would overcome his father figure in order to attain the love of his mother. That was a really powerful uh, psychosis for Dolly, and, and he uh, had a lot of sort of personal uh, experience with that when uh, his, his father kicked him out of the house in 1929, and so he, he did sort of feel as though he was re rebelling against a sort of paternal authority, and he saw this parallel in the writings of Freud as well. This was significant and spellbound because obviously the, the film is based on this idea that an Oedipal trauma can lead someone into a neurosis, forget about a murder, and uh, it's very much built around this sort of Freudian plan. So, so Dolly would have known very, very well what constituted an Oedipus complex uh, when Hitchcock uh, asked him about the film, when I'm sure he recognized it right away. Dolly had a brother die before he was born. And of course in the film, it's very much about the main character killing his brother accidentally. So Dolly would have been able to laden that with tremendous Freudian baggage. There are other interesting parallels that Dolly would have been able to bring into Spellbound, probably if he'd had more artistic liberty. When Freud uh, met Dali in London in 1938, he wrote to the Austrian writer Stefan Zweig. Stefan Zweig was the go-between between the two men. And Freud wrote to Stefan Zweig that he always considered uh, surrealist people as, I quote, total lunatics, and he added, he might reconsider his position after meeting Dali. He was very interested in this fanatic Spaniard, as he put it, um, and he said that it would be very interesting to analyze his painting. Freudian analysis teaches us uh, dreams bypass the usual sort of id controls, social constraints that um, we oppose upon ourselves in, in our rational lives. Dreams are the ways where our subconscious breaks forward and tells us things that perhaps we don't want to think about. Um, and the Surrealists were very, very interested in that because they saw that as a way of breaking through these social constraints. I think also that one of the interesting things about Surrealism, and especially about perhaps Dali's form of Surrealism, is to do with this idea of his idea of the paranoid critique, which is the idea that reality doesn't matter. It's how you perceive the, the world and what how you want to interpret the world that's much more important. This generation of people who literally, I think, discovered the mind. They discovered types of art, surrealism particularly, that were getting at the inner dreamlike states that we all know. And Dali was a painter of that world. It was Hitchcock's idea to ask Dali to do the dream sequences. Selznick accused him of only doing it for publicity value, but Hitch liked the sort of sharpness of the images and the sense of, in, of eternity that he introduced into the images. I think maybe first the basis of this has to be that Dali was a bankable name and to attach his name to this film would give it extra cachet, would also increase the seriousness of the project and would increase the publicity and ultimately the saleability of the film. Whoever got the idea, it really wasn't a bad one and it was another way for Hitchcock to talk about his film. We're using this famous Spanish artist, Salvador Dali, on our film and wait till you see what we have that nobody else has. And so in terms of promotion, and I'm sure Selznick was thinking about that, Dolly was not a bad investment. Now Dolly, like Hitchcock, was a sort of fairly recent arrival on American shores, again sort of escaping war-torn Europe. And like Hitchcock, he was someone who was a, a, an inveterate self-promoter. You know, you can almost say that Salvador Dolly was more famous than Salvador Dolly's art in some regards. The first film he makes for Hollywood is Moon Tide in 1941. He is brought in to make a basically nightmares. So it's a sort of moment of delirium, sort of parachuted into what is a quite normal film structure. Very different from the previous films, which were much less narratively driven and much more about imagery. Dolly wanted to have a dream sequence there, but uh, his ideas were a bit too 
off the wall and then the director changed Archie Mayo and so th that dream sequence didn't get realized. But the art director from Moon Tide, James Bassavi, was also the art director for uh, Spellbound. And so I can imagine that perhaps there was some influence there as well, that you know, Dolly had sort of gotten into the business of making nightmares and one hadn't been realized yet and so maybe this was Dolly's opportunity to finally, uh, finally realize something with Hollywood. And again, this is when Hollywood itself is waking up to Freudian analysis. And that's one of the most interesting things about um, Spellbound, is that it is the first film to take psychoanalysis seriously. This is very um, specific about the fact that uh, Freudian analysis is the way we treat the diseases of the mind of the sane, not the insane. Hitchcock and Selznick both liked the idea of Salvador Dali doing the dream sequence because Dali was kind of fashionable and it was great publicity for the film. You have to realize that in 1936 Dali was on the cover of Time magazine. The studio actually researched the dollar amount of publicity that the name Salvador Dali would bring to the film and they reckoned it was $50,000 in 1944, an enormous amount of money. Time magazine and Life magazine would come out and do a story about the film just because Salvador Dali was involved. However, if you look at why Hitchcock wanted to work with Salvador Dali, it's very, very different. He was interested because um, he said prior to that, dreams had always been rather hazy and he wanted the sort of photorealism of Dali's craft to come in because he said nightmares are frighteningly real, especially to those who dream them. Hitchcock wanted to show a dream in a way that it had never been shown in film before. He wanted to show it in broad daylight. What he would have preferred to do was to shoot the image, shoot the dream sequences in black and white with the outside and the bright sunlight so that the, the lens would have to be stopped down so that everything would be extremely sharp, like needle sharp. But that would have created a problem with the rest of the photography of the picture, which was sort of that woman's photography kind of picture. It was slightly diffused, the whole film. Selznick said, this looks like it was shot by monogram pictures. He, could, he didn't like the look that Hitchcock was getting. And he eventually reduced the dream sequence considerably in length. But what is there is really a masterpiece of uh, cinematic surrealism. The dream sequence has a very strong narrative function, but I think it also just is, is a moment in the film where Hitchcock wants us to have direct experience of serial art, which again, Dolly is doing in his language what Hitchcock is doing in his language, which is expressing the voice of the unconscious in, in other than rational verbal language. I remember Salvador picked out a gorgeous nightgown f for me, and I put it on, it was beautiful, very expensive. Then, while I'm standing there, he's taking the scissors and he's chopping it all over. He's chopping it up, this beautiful gown. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm explaining, it's for the dream sequence. Oh, and he's chopping it and chopping it and cutting it and cutting it. And I was heartbroken, it was so beautiful. I said, why did they just, why didn't they just use a rag? And the dream sequence uh, was incredible uh, before it got finished because when it came out in the film, it was much different. The dream sequence, as it was intended to be, does not exist. There are still photos lying about, but what we have is a somewhat truncated version of what Dolly and Hitchcock had envisioned. The story about Spellbound is quite sad because the film as he conceived it with Hitchcock um, was that it would have five sequences. Um, you would go from the gambling house to the rooftop where the proprietor is killed. The narrator would then flee across a barren landscape. He would end up at a dance where he would kiss Ingrid Bergman and she would turn into a statue. And then he would flee from a winged statue down a pyramid. We have illustrations for all of this and we know that a number of these scenes were filmed. Dolly was going to revisit parts of the Andalusian dog by having a plaster cast made of Ingrid Bergman's face and spiders or insects or ants crawl out of this. Not quite what star maker Selznick would have in mind for Ingrid Bergman, one of the great beauties of all time and one of his great commercial <laughs> you know, products. So you don't mess with the Ingrid Bergman persona in quite that way. The fact that there is a, a Ingrid Bergman turning into stone in the dream sequence, I think Dolly may have been trying to insert some more subtle uh, Freudian imagery in there. Everything in the dream 
again, is a little bit literalized. In other words, they're playing a game of 21. Ah, they met at the 21 Club. Um, there was a scantily clad woman. Oh, that must be you. The thing that's interesting, like with these curtains hanging and the eyes and stuff like that, is that Hitchcock has the courage uh, to throw into uh, you know, a fairly conventional suspense thriller uh, some, some major surrealist art. I think Dolly really liked the idea of this ballroom sequence, partially because it didn't have anything really to do with the rest of the film, and so it gave him a chance to sort of shine. Dolly, I think, essentially thought, this will be my movie. The entire thing will be, uh, you know, very stream of consciousness and, 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 you know, it can all be surreal and, and symbolic. But it, but it really, in this, in this film, has a, a very specific purpose. But the original plans were more elaborate. One of the things that Selznick hoped to do, actually, with Dali was to actually cut down on cost. He had hoped that apart from the gambling room scene, it would all be shot against the backdrops that Salvador Dali painted. However, the ballroom scene called for live action. Dolly put a lot of effort into this ballroom sequence that was going to have um, Valentine and, and Constance dancing in a large ballroom with other people, and there would be an orchestra overhead with large pianos hanging down from the ceiling. They tried to, to force the scale by using dwarfs in the background, gnome-sized people in the front. The forced perspective just did not work. How this would have looked in the finished dream sequence is left to our imagination. Dali and Hitchcock, when they left in September, um, they thought they had shot everything. And in fact, they had looked at the rushes and they had, in, they had decided that if they added in just a, a shot of Gregory Peck's face at one point, the dialogue in the film would match. However, when they actually started to look at it projected, they realized there were lighting problems. The film itself could not be used. It wasn't up to the standard. It's the Dolly designs that give a certain continuity to the dream sequence, even though it's the result of more than one pair of hands. It's, of course, something that's worked out between Hitchcock and Dolly. But then Selznick has to weigh in on it. Selznick felt that the dream sequence just wasn't packing enough punch. He, he was disappointed, and he said it wasn't Dolly's fault, that, that Dolly's images were actually surprisingly suited for the purpose, but he just didn't feel like it was going very well. And so, um, so he called in uh, William Cameron Menzies, uh, with whom he had worked on Gone with the Wind. Menzies went through and uh, basically redesigned how all of the scenes would be shot. The final film is really much more indebted to Menzies than really Dolly or Hitchcock. What happened, obviously, was they did change it. They cut out two sequences and shortened it. But Dali actually offered to work for free. And you have to realize that Dali was nicknamed Avida Dollar, avid for dollars. Um, so for him to actually offer to work for free really shows how interested he was in working for Hollywood. Whether they replicate dreams persuasively or not, who knows? I suppose it depends on how one dreams. But what they do is indicate both how like art dreams are and how like in particular the art of this film dreams are. My guess is that Dolly, if he had had his druthers, would not have had such a very close connection between the presumed import of the dream and the presumed visual export of the dream sequence. But that's what we're left with, a dream sequence that, in retrospect, seems to lose a little of its power. All of that said, it's still rather interesting. I, I think that there actually is an integrity there, and, and, and Spellbound was something that was really important to him. I think he really did want it to be a really good film, and he wanted his work to be something that he would be proud of. Dali, I think, realized that he would never do a single film in Hollywood, but I think he also realized that that was okay. He could parachute in a sort of moment of madness, almost like a sort of a moment of a virus or a moment of infection into the film that would radically alter the way the rest of the film was viewed. But I think he was frustrated. Um, he was desperate to work in Hollywood. He realized its power and, and the sort of wide audience it could, it could match, it could meet. And he was anxious to harness that power. And so I think that he did manage to come to some kind of um, happy medium with the film industry as, as it existed in Hollywood. Uh -huh.